Coming up on the Invent With Me podcast. Change your life money. Send your kids to college. And later, you should have very, very, very low expectations going into a licensing scenario. Welcome to the Invent With Me podcast. My name is Grant, inventor of Torque Strap. And I'm Marcus, inventor of Quick Tie Down Anchors. Reddit question, Marcus. Mm -hmm. Is it better to license or build your product yourself? What sort of situations slash products would lean towards licensing and which would lean towards building the product yourself? What sort of margins can you get with venturing on your own versus licensing? Mm. What do you think? Uh, I mean, the the should you license or should you do it yourself is, I think, the epitome of, of all inventors' questions, especially when they are starting out. It was mine. I think it might have been yours as well. It was and everybody's. Everybody, I, I know a good four or five people who, uh, who did the same, and everybody who thought they were going to license ended up starting and running a company. Right. Um, the answer is, is it better? Um, uh, we're big fans of building it yourself. Um, the, again, this is an opinion. Uh, I have no knowledge of anybody who has licensed anything who is like, I'm so glad I licensed it. And I know you have a story in a second of, of one person, but my two cents there are, you know, with... with um, Building it yourself, you have the control and the ownership of it. Uh, you definitely have higher profit margins. It's a little more expensive to get into because you're, you know, whether you're bootstrapping or, or doing whatever, it's going to be more expensive. But you're building a brand. You're taking ownership. You can, you know, you, you make those those innovations and changes. And overall, you're going to be making a lot more money by doing it yourself. The short story to licensing versus inventing can pretty much be summarized by this. Licensing is great for gas money. Yep. Developing the product yourself is great for FU money. Change your life money. Send your kids to college. Uh, quit your day job in, in a matter of two and a half to, three, to four years. Mm -hmm. um, that's based on my personal experience. Uh, you mentioned that we both looked at licensing in different forms because, yes, everybody loves this idea of collecting checks and passive income, blah, blah, blah. But the sad truth is there are very few companies who can sell your product that well. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine this. You're very fired up. You're very passionate about your product and your project. You, you're so passionate, in fact, that you have the energy to call 30 to 50 companies Right, so you're packed with knowledge. You're already packed with drive. You're already packed with this uphill challenge. You know what people are going to say, the positives and the negatives. Stop spending so much time on the phone and spend more time on the Alibaba. Spend more time researching what other product developers have done. Read more books like the Nike stories and things like that of people who had these dreams and didn't know where to go and brought a product to market because – you're right. We've not heard any really good anecdotal case of a licensing deal that makes someone truly happy. Well, and I think the last four, maybe the last four podcasts, I've said, hey, we're looking for people who have had yeah. success, either had success in licensing or, or somebody who's in licensing who have had success on the other side of it. Right. And and we have not got one email about anything. Unfortunately, no, we get a lot of questions. Should yeah. I license or sell? And we're trying to come up with the perfect answer. Um, I did actually get lucky, though. I, sp I spoke with one gentleman, mm -hmm. uh, awesome guy named Sean, and he had a licensing experience. Uh, I wouldn't classify his products as uh, life-changing, and he admitted that. He knows that. Things uh, along the lines of new versions of cup holders, new Halloween toys, things like that. So some kind of low margin, some kind of seasonal, but he did uh, hunt down about 30 or so companies, okay? And one of the last companies said, yes, we'll take you on. Now, he didn't mention it, but you can imagine if, if it takes you 30 times to get someone to maybe say yes, you have no leverage in this conversation. Mm -hmm. People always ask, how do I negotiate a good licensing deal? You can't. Yeah. What are you backing it off of? You're not saying, well, I'm gonna no, I, I want five percent royalties. If you don't take it, I'm going back to the 29th call and I'm gonna no, they don't exist. Right. You can't pit one against the other. You that's so your baseline is whatever the hell they tell you. Now, in a on a gross profit margin, they're gonna aim for like two percent. So they want to give you two percent of the MSRP, what it's gonna sell for on the shelves. 
there may be d- people who say, oh, well, I got a 7% rate. Well, there's some muddy water in there. Maybe that's 7% on the profit. And the profit is half of the MSRP. So it all evens out. Right. They can't afford to pay you much. They're not even going to make much money. And the reason is they're going to sell it uh, on a pricing basis. They're going to try to be the best price, uh, volume, things like that. So there's not a lot of margin in the product. There's not a high price. And quite honestly, it, it it's really rare for companies, the size of company you're going to find that will license your crap, they're going to be small. That's why they took your call. They're flexible. They want to experiment. But because they're small, their distribution channel is going to suck. They're going to sell on their website. They're going to tell you they have a couple products that got into a Lowe's or a Walmart or whatever, but that's not your product, so that doesn't matter. And then they're going to sell your product on Amazon. They're going to struggle to sell 100 units a month. Uh, And and that's after eight months of development. Because remember, you just gave them a napkin drawing. You just gave them a provisional patent and some 3D renderings that you paid a couple hundred bucks for. They have to figure out what kind of plastic this is made of. They have to go fight with their manufacturer on the injection mold. Some plastics swell. Some plastics don't. Some are foggy, transparent, and not. Uh, Some lose strength with all these different variations of the way they can be built. They have to fight tooth and nail through that for you for like eight months to a year. So you're not getting paid for a year. okay? And then when you do get paid, they're barely going to push it because they don't really believe in it. No, it's, it's it's true, and that's something that people have to be realistic about. In in the the small case that you do get somebody interested, they're doing all the work. Yeah, and and that's what I think a lot of people have this misconception. Like I've got this great idea, and you're going to want it, and you're going to do all the work for it, and I'm going to make a crap ton of money. It doesn't work that way, and it it shouldn't. I mean, it'd be fantastic if it did, but. Yeah, like you said, the, there's going to be small margins that they're going to be making. So how are they going to give you this monster piece of every single sale? It just doesn't work that way. And to expect that, you should have very, very, very low expectations going into a licensing scenario. Yeah, some candid numbers Okay, um, on licensing. Let's say you license a product to a company and they're like, great, we love it. We're going to start development and we're going to sell it for $60. As I said, I would be shocked if after a year of developing, getting the marketing material, okay, so 365 days, you get zero paycheck. Let's say best case scenario, year two, they're selling 100 units a month, like I said, through their online channels. They're hunting down retailers, but it's an uphill battle. Uh, a $60 product, if your, pro- if, if your royalty is 4% on, on the gross, on the MSRP, which is a pretty good royalty, Expect to make 240 bucks a month. Again, that's great. That's gas money. It didn't take too much of your time. Wonderful. But have fun <laughs> clocking in Monday morning for the rest of your life. Yeah. Because you don't, you don't have anything beyond that. Well, and the example you had given about the guy with the um, Halloween toys, you said that his first year he made $800 or yeah. it was about a year, so 800 and he was hoping to make upwards of like maybe $3,000 the next year. Right. So that just puts things into perspective as well. Sure, he didn't have uh, an initial cost, but $800 isn't going to do a whole lot of nothing for you, and even $3,000 is going to do a whole lot of nothing for you over a whole year. Yeah. Yeah. I I think the shorter answer is if you care at all about your product, if you're passionate about it, develop it yourself. Mm -hmm. If it's tangible, if it's something you have the means to implement, which you'd be surprised at what you can implement yourself when you utilize this podcast and the resources and you find the right people. But if that's completely out of your realm, you have no intention of ever quitting your job, good for you, the American workforce needs you, but you're not going to have F you money. That's the bottom line. And and to be fair, you're not going to have F you money uh, building it yourself specifically in the first couple of years, no, right? I mean, I'm I'm a year and a half in. No, no, actually a little less than that. And I'm still not, I'm probably breaking even, maybe making a touch of money. Yeah. The potential's there. I'm getting there. But it's not like I built the thing and I'm FU. You. You're two and a half years in, three, three? I'm almost four years in. Oh, you're four years in. Yeah. But to be open, you're, you're pulling in a seven-figure uh, sales number, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah. That's also not fu money because you have the expenses that Correct. match that, but it's getting there. It's getting there. So. I can, I can, I've now laid out the path where 
if I have the inventory, mm-hmm. I just inject more money into my marketing and I get the return yep. and that's it. Yep. You can't do anything too fast. A lot of people might be saying, well, then buy more inventory, pay for more marketing. You can't roll too fast because yeah. we just changed manufacturers. They screwed up the first order. They screwed up half of the second order. The third order we're banking on being 92% <laughs> quality. Yeah. And even then you have to commission your warehouse to inspect these goods. So it happens slowly, but look at the leverage position I'm in versus three years ago when I was trying to license my product, which by the way, no one listened. And now I'm selling $2 million a year of that same product. Mm -hmm. Now they come to me and they say, well, we want to license it and we want to give you a 2% royalty rate. I tell them to go fly a kite. Yeah, I'm like, you guys could never sell the amount that I'm selling. If you got into a Home Depot, they would hack the margins down so low. I'm not interested in making 2% on a $24 set of straps. Yeah, I'm, I'm just not. And retail is cool. Yeah, there's 800 Home Depots, uh, U.S. and Canada. That's great. But even if each store sells, um, you know, 20 or 30 a month, that really doesn't compare to what I can do on Amazon myself and collect a much higher margin. Right. So the, the last part of his question was, you know, the margins versus venturing or licensing. I think we pretty well explained it. Yeah. I mean, the margin from a percentage basis is 10 to 1. You're talking 2% versus 35, 40, 50%. Yeah. Um, expect, if you're developing the product and you're selling it well, you list your price at a 60% margin, you subtract fees, you end up with a 30% profit margin. That is much better than 2%, 15 times better than 2%. It is. And, and if you're if you're nervous about the, I don't want to run a company, I, I'm not going to have the knowledge, I don't have the resources to, to pull all this together, none of us did. Like, uh, I sure as hell didn't. And you just take it a step at a time. And, you know, you learn about the manufacturing. China becomes less scary and, and, and emails become less scary. And, um, you know, marketing and figuring out all the social medias and your Shopify's. One day at a time. My, it was like an, a brain overload when I first started. And it was the same for all the people I know in, in the, you know, who was like, I don't want to run a company. You figure it out. And then you start getting excited about it. And of course, you have your up and down days. But overall, it's just really exciting that you're doing it yourself and that whatever energy you put into it, it gets gets shown and it comes back out. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. I have another question yep. that's based around licensing. Sure. So I'm going to do these out of order, but okay. this is the the short page I gave you. Yeah. Um, so I posed something on on Reddit, which was basically, you know, licensing is a, a, not a scam, but a sham. It's a it's a dead end. Things you need to know before licensing. And 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 someone piped in, and they said, well, you know, sometimes licensing is the only way. This comes from I am Ocean on Reddit. Sometimes it's the only way. For example. If I had an invention designed as an addition for a vehicle, what would you advise? I wouldn't be it, it wouldn't be feasible to create an auto company to adopt the in- invention. How likely is it to license an invention to create an auto manufacturer? Or, or not a license an invention to an yeah. auto manufacturer. Now, we kind of went back and forth and I basically said, well, you know, no matter what the product is, you have to implement these steps that we preach on this podcast, which is Show something. Mm -hmm. Show something besides explaining to a thousand people your idea. You can die penniless with patents galore, but because you never implemented anything on your deathbed, you will again you'll be penniless with 10 patents. You're just the guy who I invented the yeah, whatever, grandpa. So when I pushed back on him and said that, this is what he said. Well, it's not just a part or an accessory. It needs to be engineered into the vehicle. Not possible to prove tangible sales because you would need to build a car brand which isn't feasible. What then? Licensing or patent sale is the only option. Maybe you can put this question in the podcast. Well, that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. What are, what are your thoughts on this conundrum? I honestly don't have a, a good a good amount of knowledge on what you would do in that case, and and that's exactly why we're going to pose that question. Has anybody out there actually in, come up with something as an addition to something that already exists, so complex like a, an automobile, and had it implemented? I I don't know that answer. Well, this always goes back to our feasibility analysis. That sure. We say, anytime you're thinking of an invention, run a mental feasibility analysis. 
Okay, so let's say that the purpose of this uh, addition to a vehicle is to make them safer or faster or stop on a dime or have an eject button, whatever it is. Scale this idea down to something palpable that people can look at and say, oh, he's yeah, he's onto something. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I, I always use the analogy, if you want to invent a car, don't start with a car. Invent a skateboard. Enjoy sales of your skateboard for a year and then upgrade to a little pedal cart and make money off the pedal cart for a year and then upgrade to a go-kart and so on and so forth. That way, you're making money throughout the journey and eventually getting to that finish line goal. Because you're right, unless you have some type of financial endowment, you're not going to start a vehicle company to implement your new invention. It makes no sense. Now, that sounds crazy to a lot of people. Everything I'm saying still sounds crazy to a lot of people. Well, Here's the short answer. If you ever want to be an inventor, if you ever want to have an invention that goes somewhere, you're going to have to start smaller. You're going to have to set your ambition a little bit lower Or dial it in, figure out how to offer that to car manufacturers in a way they can see the results. But you're going to run into a lot of deaf ears when you're just trying to explain your new idea, why you think it's better, why you think it's 10% safer, 10% faster. That's not a good way to spend your time. If you have a job, a family, spend your time more wisely, develop something you can implement. Yeah, I think think that's a, a great point still to answer this guy's question. It, it it is very difficult to without a, a demonstrable something to sell somebody on anything, right? So if it is a little teeny piece of plastic that goes in in the air, you know, the air dampers that does something special, then prototype it, and at least you have something to to show. But if you just have a, a straight idea. It makes it very difficult, and it also makes it difficult. It's one of those scenarios where if you don't have it well thought out and something in front of you, you know, it's changed. The USPTO has definitely changed from um, first to think about it to first to actually patent file. it to file, which means like you go tell somebody your idea, and it, we're, we're, we're such big advocates of don't worry about telling your idea to somebody, but in this case where it's so specific to like a car manufacturer, an auto manufacturer, right. it makes it very difficult. So again, I don't, I don't have a great answer for that question, and if anybody's out there who has licensed something like that or, or sold something like that to a, a much bigger company to be a part of something that they had already created, we'd love to hear from you. Definitely. Absolutely. Uh, Next question. Uh, Father Goose, a friend of mine actually named Randy, cool guy, he wants to learn about all things venturing. That's his question for today's podcast. More details on bootstrapping your startup, DIY short run methods, Etsy, Shopify, DIY, social media, etc. He's got a three-part question, but let's break down that first part first. Yeah. What are you you thinking? Um, I mean, bootstrapping is... I, I read some statistics that the majority of startups actually bootstrap. And bootstrapping, for people who don't know, just means you're basically doing it yourself and you're pulling together your own resources to be able to do it. So it's not like you go out and borrow a million dollars. It's like you might pull pull locally and, and parents and whatever it may be, you're, you're bootstrapping. Um, short run is a great idea. Obviously, if you don't have a proven concept, but you have a great prototype, and uh, stuff like this, then instead of going to China and getting 10,000 units of your product that you don't know whether it works or not, you can find a short uh, run method. Like maybe it's 3D printing 20 20 of your products so you can Mm -hmm. test it out or sell. Or even if it's super niche, then maybe 3D printing is the way to go. Who knows? Yeah. Um, It's not a, I don't think it's a great ultimate way. And I've seen that online, but... um, I don't know. That's my two cents on on that. I'm just like, it's always great to be able to pull together your own resources and not borrow because the worst thing you can do is start getting the headache and the the anxiety of having to pay somebody back or having them breathing down your neck. So yeah. in my case, I did. I saved up and I, I'm bootstrapping my company. Yeah. So uh, more money is usually not. It's usually worse. It can be. More money is better. I think it's usually worse, and the reason is. You need to spend that first year finding out how do I make money off of nothing? How do I do a lot with a little? The worst thing that could have happened to me in the beginning was getting $100,000. Yep. Because I would never be able to tell you where that went, and I would still be paying that off today. 
So I'm not a fan of loans. I'm not a, really a fan of crowd funding unless you are ready to uh, give them the product. Like a Kickstarter with pre-orders is totally fine. I use Kickstarter all the time. For every new product I'm going to launch, I do a Kickstarter. It costs nothing. They take 5%. And the backers know they're going to get a product at the end of it. But to go to a bank and say, give me a personal loan at a 14% interest rate and think in your head that in, in six to nine months, you're going to be making enough revenue to pay that loan back, uh, you're kind of smoking crack because you're going you're gonna to lose all that money doing the wrong thing. Because you, you you think, oh, I have a lot of money. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invest more in my company. I love that term, invest. The real investment is time. Investing money, it, it, it's the easier part. It's the time and the know-how to make a return. Now, as far as as far as DIY short runs, Randy, I, I actually know Randy's doing uh, plastic products. Um, injection molding is something you can do in your garage, but I'll say this. You can do it still cheaper in China, in my opinion. So like a, an average, a good quality injection molding benchtop setup is going to cost you over two grand, more like $4,000. And then you have to source the molds. The molds have to be steel. They need to be machined. So you're going to find some independent mold making guy. I found one on YouTube. Cool guy. He'll make your molds, but they can only be so big. You can't do really big parts like Cidio crates, you know, things like that. So now you've invested uh, four grand in your machine, two grand in your mold, plus you need ventilation, all that stuff. I mean, you don't want to do this crap in your house. If you're trying a short run, Marcus mentioned that 3D printing is great. Sand them, paint them, make them a little bit pretty. Uh, but if you want to do a short run, I mean, you can do several thousand small plastic pieces in China. Your mold's going to cost you 1900 bucks. Your run, the parts are going to cost you $0.10 cents a piece. That's pretty much anything smaller than an apple and hollow. It's going to be like 10 to $0.15 cents a piece. So I would leave that work to the professionals, not saying that you're going to do a better job or you're going to do a worse job, but you're going to end up spending more money uh, compromising your lungs, comprom compromising the corner of your garage, all that good stuff, and it's not really scalable. Uh, for people who sell one-off toys because they have a YouTube following and it's kitschy, sure, mold them up in your garage. But if you have any intention on going into production, just figure that out now. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, Etsy, Shopify, mm -hmm. DIY, social media. How do we get more sales? Well, I mean, Etsy is very niche. Um, I, you know, it's one of one, definitely one of the different platforms. Um, I feel like Etsy is definitely the one-off short run kind of ki king or queen. Yeah, and uh, and that's a, a great way to do it. I mean, if you're if you have that kitschy little cute product, then Etsy's a, a good idea. Shopify, I mean, this is more just kind of telling you what they are. I mean, you can look all this stuff up yourself. Right. right. This was part of Randy's question. You know, yeah. how do we, how do we sell more? Where yeah. where do we put it? I mean, Shopify is a great a great platform. It's easy. It's what I use. It's also what you use. Yeah. And, and I know a bunch of other people. It's user friendly for um, us to create a website, and also it gives you a lot of um, options as far as add ons, whether it's ratings or, or uh, reviews and ratings, um, selling different metrics and it's it's easy to use also if you end up getting yourself a little fulfillment person then they can tap in there and they can get your orders and sell them so i, I i'm a big fan of shopify definitely you gotta yeah. have a shopify and i want to touch on something that someone said once in our podcast well amazon has uh 300 million active users mm. right they have the giant market so i'm just going to focus on amazon the pictures the keywords you're wrong, and here's why. Amazon has a cap that a lot of people don't know about. Yes, they have a huge user base, but they also have 30 million active sellers. That means they have huge, you have huge competition. So whatever very, like I make a strap that's fairly unique, you know, it's quite off the beaten path. But still, I'm competing against 15 other top-ranking ratchet strap manufacturers. I'm competing against uh, rope, which you can get for pennies. I'm, you're competing against all these different things, and you only get so much of people's attention on Amazon. 
frankly, you're going to hit a cap on Amazon because of the competition. You can run ads. You can have the most perfect listing, the most perfect keywords and images. You're still going to hit that cap. And, then, and that could mean that you hit a point where you sell 1500 bucks a day on Amazon and you just can't really get past it because the competition is too fierce. The margins start to cut down because you're running so many ads. But with Shopify, why I really want to key on the fact that you have to have a good website and a good Amazon is because your Facebook ads manager is going to drive all the traffic to your Shopify or your Wix or whatever it is they're going to be able to see the data from the relationship between the ads and the website via a pixel. So he can't send the traffic to your Amazon store and say, hey, Marcus, by the way, your, your, uh, your, your customers are adding the card at 70%. That's great. He gets nothing. He can't retarget these customers via a new uh, Facebook ad video. He can't do anything. So to really scale your company, you have to run ads and drive the traffic to your website where you can see, why aren't they adding to cart? Do I need to change? I once changed my add to cart button from black to green and increased my add to cart conversion rate by 3%. That's crazy. Okay, At the volume we're at, that's money, man. That's money. So just to be clear, you, you can point um, a, a link to your Amazon account but what you're saying is you don't get the metrics behind it to see who put what you in the card. You can't scale it. Right, you can't scale you can't do it. shit so, with it. Yeah, I have like some of my social media posts send people to Amazon because people just like Amazon, right? What I can tell is how many of those people clicked to go to the website. I can't tell you how many sales happened because of that. So I don't know anything as far as how well whatever my... my um, uh, advertisement was doing right. to do that right yeah yeah so that's why it's important to send people because the shopify lets you do all that yes yeah and then what happens is there's a snowball effect happening with your shopify account and your and your facebook ads they're sending more and more traffic to your store and that makes more and more people curious who bleed over and mm -hmm. check amazon and then they buy it on amazon that's the proper proper funnel to think that you're gonna go i'm just gonna be an amazon seller it doesn't work and that's why um, Randy also asked about DIY social media. Mm -hmm. That's a must. It is a must. I mean, I have, we, we've talked about that in the past. We've talked about you having those two days of, of phenomenal, crazy viral sales because of it. And even me now, I chopped up a video that I had done a couple weeks ago. It's at 650,000 views. It's incredible. That's incredible. For, for me, it's incredible. I mean, I know there are people out there with me, but it is a direct correlation and I go on my Amazon, and sure enough, that week was substantially higher than, than other weeks. So right. it, we, we, we talk about it a lot. It's something you can do for free, basically going on, posting, making little posts and little videos. It gets exhausting. You get burnt out. You'll probably get gaps, but then you see something like I just saw where one of my you know, weeks was amazing because of one of my posts, and you get refired up about it. So I'm I'm a huge, still a huge fan and advocate of doing your own DIY social media. It's a must. Yeah, we're talking with uh, Billy on Instagram. Mm -hmm. He's developing the the knuckle saver crank. Mm -hmm. um, awesome product. Awesome dude. And he's he just he just put himself out there. He's not the kind of guy who shoots videos of himself. Yeah. You know, he's a he's a trucker in his fifties. That that's his profession. But he thought of an invention that's going to save people from getting injuries when they're wrapping up their straps on their flatbed. And we said, well, just shoot it, man. Just yeah. shoot a video of you using it. He, he's like, hey, guys, just want to let you know I posted the video. It's already got a couple hundred views yeah. on multiple platforms. And, and this is coming from a guy who's used to posting something probably on Facebook and it getting two likes and 25 views. Yeah. Right. So he just quadrupled his exposure by utilizing very simple principles, which is shoot yourself in a vertical format, keep it short, throw some music behind it, make it arresting, challenge what people typically think about these products and say, no, F that. This is my product. This is why it's better. So he sent us that video. And he said, well, what, what, what could I do to make it better? Because it was pretty run in the mill. He was just explaining the product, mm -hmm. d using it in front of camera. That's great. That's very what I call bottom of funnel video. That's somebody who's about ready to buy it. They just need to understand how it works. Top of funnel videos 
is what you really shoot for on social media. And that's the in your face. That's the a ratchet strap killed my dog mm -hmm. when I was five. That's the uh, this is why ratchet straps suck. That's for Billy. That would be. I said to him, maybe put a bandage around your hand. Yeah. Don't be afraid to, to to do a little, be a little goofy. As long as your product is legit, so put a bandage around your hand. Put it right in the camera's face and say, "This is the seventh time this month I've torn my knuckles apart." Throw the old version in the trash and show them your new version. Mm -hmm. Can all be done in fifteen seconds. It's arresting. You have an injury. You have blood. You're grabbing their attention. Uh, don't focus so much on the sales. Like this is where you can get it. You can pre-order now. It's, I think it's going to be about twenty four ninety five. F all that. They don't. Need, if they really care, they'll figure it out. They'll find the link in your bio. You have to appease the eyeballs first, and then the sales will come. As soon as you get selfish, as soon as you get salesy, as soon as you start telling them details about you know mm -hmm. the product and pricing and where to buy it, you've turned them off because yeah. they realize they just got suckered into watching an ad. But well, if, Go ahead. No, That's I was just going to say, and, and I, it, it's a, it's a good point. Is like the the dance videos and the dog videos and all those things. They're fun and entertaining, but there's absolutely a place for a normal based person who's using a product, and this is why, and whatever it is, and people appreciate that, and those are the ones who also get forwarded in the community and the industry of what it is. Because you know, I guarantee you that all all the truckers will be like. Hell yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, what about this? Hell yeah. And then that's where it starts to blast. And then that's, you know, so that's fantastic for him. Yeah, I love what he's doing. Yeah. So I would say right now at the stage, if you're in the beginning stages of social media, get really good at those top of funnel videos, mm -hmm. those arresting videos, those why this product has been tormenting you your whole life and what I have that's going to solve it. Throw shade on other products. I mean, don't throw shade on like people's names or their brands but throw shade on the way things have been done, mm -hmm. right? I throw shade on ratchet straps 24-7 because they're such an easy target. They're big companies that don't really care about social media. They're not thinking about this stuff. I don't mention any company by name. I just say, hey, why haven't these changed in 100 years? What the hell? Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Second part of Randy's question. So he wants to know, Randy wants to know about all things venturing. Uh, sourcing outside of China, especially Mexico, how to make connections there. Well, that's, that's tough. You know, it is. And, uh, you know, it's hard enough to, to figure out the, like, again, the China one, which is the easy go-to. But things like Alibaba um, and those, you can also pick where you, you're you looking for those Yeah, sources. but it sucks. It does suck, but it's it's still a start of a resource. Like, if somebody's starting with nothing, there's there's that. There's also the Chamber of Commerce. You can go. You can find the the, the chamber of commerce will, uh, of different places. You know, I looked this up to to try sure. to get some more information. Like Mexico, you know, they obviously want to bring manufacturing to Mexico, so they have some resources to help. But I still think a trade show. Uh, Stephanie had had come on to our show and also described 24, that. Yeah, and she was like, "You go there and you get to talk to all sorts of manufacturers from all sorts of different places. It's a great resource. You're not going there as a seller." You're going there as a guest of just the, you know, to go check it out. And you get to talk to all these different manufacturers as well. That's a good point. And it's it's not nearly as scary because these people are face to face. They're obviously in somewhere that you feel pretty safe about. And you can talk to other people about that. Oh, they'll be so happy to, to chat of with you. Of course they would. They don't know if you're big or small. And, and every every client is a client to them. Yeah. And there's there's also, I mean, Alibaba, I know it's, it's a little harder. There's Thomas Net and there's like, uh, what is it, Global global sources or something like that. There's some different ones that allow you to look up different manufacturers in different countries. Here's the thing, though. We've talked about this a lot. Yeah. Um, the thing about Mexico is they're going to get their crap from China. Really yeah. what you're doing is assembling in Mexico. Um, you know, we've all heard that Fords are assembled in Mexico. Like, yes, you can set up big manufacturing plants where you own and control the process, but... It's Realistically, if you're doing a plastic item, for me, all my components would still... I've, I've looked into sourcing torque straps in China. Mm -hmm. Well, where would you make the hooks? Oh, those all come from China. And the no, no, no. You mean Mexico. Sourcing in Mexico. 
I looked into having a, a, a Mexican manufacturer, okay, right? When I spoke to the man, Mexican manufacturer, I asked, well, where would you get the hooks and the buckles and all that China. stuff? It's all China. Right. So now you're adding another um, middleman link in the chain that could break a middleman. Now you're paying China to ship it to Mexico. Then you're paying Mexico to ship it to you. No, 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 no. Can't do that. Yeah. Adds up. It adds up. So that's, that's my opinion. Yes, um, I think like Marcus gave the resources to find them. Beyond that, it's just the generic... Uh, skills that we always preach about about how to speak to these manufacturers you know be precise don't just say can you make this say how would you make this right where would you source it uh if they're doing something plastic for you they're probably going to buy the mold from china and you're not part of that transaction so they could tell you the mold costs 2500 when it costs 1900 so be leery with uh going that route um i'm sure there's plenty of things that could be fully manufactured in mexico I just don't know what they are. And we're using Mexico as an example. You know, I, I know there's a few other countries, but I, I also think the the trade show is a good place to talk. And it's great advice. A- ask them what they're, where are they manufacturing it in house or are they pulling together the parts? Because if they are pulling together from, a, let's say, a China, then you're, you might as well just cut out the, the fat and go straight there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Uh, the third part of Father Goose's question. Mm-hmm is he wants to know about holistic IP strategies and moats, mm-hmm. so, which means holistic intellectual property strategies. How do, we, how do we protect our stuff? How do we build a moat around our castle yeah. and stay safe? Right. Well, I mean, if, you're, if you, you're building it yourself, then I think a good quality brand and really focusing on brand recognition so that when people, you know, if there are a knockoff or a secondary, people trust and come to you. That's always a good one. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, having diversity and not having all your ducks in one place necessarily and being able to pull from other places, uh, that helps with building a strong moat around your product that if something drops in one side, that you are prepared to make up for that with other resources. Um, what about what are you thinking about it? Here's what I think. Yeah. I think from a fundamental standpoint, a lot of inventors, here's my analogy, mm-hmm. a lot of inventors think that when they have this idea and they put it in the public, it's equivalent to putting a Rolls Royce in their driveway with the keys sitting on the seat. Mm -hmm. They're worried someone's going to walk up and take it. The reality is your invention is the backyard furniture on your patio, okay? Anyone could walk up and take it, but you don't lock it. You don't nail it down because no one's going to take it. No one cares enough. What do people steal? People steal things that are right in front of them. People walk into Apple stores and rip those freaking phones right off the safety cords, walk out with 60 cell phones because they know they can sell it. You know, why don't they steal your lawn furniture? Because it's dusty. They got to figure out some logistics. They got to figure out where to pawn it, all that stuff. It's the same with your invention. People don't steal it because it's dusty. They got to figure out the love logistics. They don't know what it's made of, how to, how to manufacture it, and if it would even sell. What they do is they knock off Nike. They knock off Apple. I still haven't been knocked off. I've been public with Torque Strap for many years. I've had four different manufacturers who know how to build it in and out. But because I'm not a huge name yet, they're not like, oh, yeah, this is a home run. Let's steal that and start selling it. Like, no, I know it's a home run. It, so this takes it takes so many years for your product to get into that threat space of IP. And by the time people care to knock it off, you have the money, means, and, and sources to protect it. And, and frankly, you're not going to care that they knock it off. It's a form of flattery. You can always say, well, it's just more exposure that, that my invention works. There would be more people uh, privy to the fact that a spring-loaded cargo strap is faster and safer. Now, when they do some research and they realize that, oh, we're the original, we're the, we're the badasses, then that's more traffic to my website. Yeah. I really don't see it as a, as a, as a huge issue. I mean, moats, uh, again, moat, the analogy is you build the moat around the castle so people can't get in. I get that. Um, if you don't like what I just said about the fact that your invention probably isn't groundbreaking, no one really wants to steal it, well, let's say they are. Well, then, like Marcus said, um, you just... You be NDA heavy, you'll be a little provisional patent heavy, all those things that you push, 
but again, I can't even entertain this conversation because well, I, I strongly believe you just don't have to worry about it. Th- those things, I mean, those things keep the mildest of people out anyway. Like if somebody wants to to knock you off, they will, and, and they probably know enough to know that they can get away with a bit. But like you said, it's just it's not worth most people's oomph yeah. to to do it. And nobody's going to put in the same effort you are. And if they have to have something manufactured or have to do something, they're not going to put in that work. Yeah. Now, there was one documentary that people may be thinking of now. I didn't see it, but I, I watched the the trailer. I get it. Um, some crappy network like a Encore or a Stars. I don't know. But anyway, essentially a guy had, had invented – a kid's toy that was you plug multiple balloons into it and then in, and then screw the hose nozzle yeah. on and it fills up like yeah. 15 water balloons at once. He got super duper knocked off. I think he pitched it to Walmart and Walmart just started private labeling it themselves. Okay. Uh, and then he went into the, the court battle with Walmart and he just got raped because he had no money. Mm-hmm. Um, they challenged the, the validity of his patent, all that stuff. So again, here's a guy who thought, oh, I'll license my cool idea and I'll pitch it to Walmart. He didn't develop it. Mm. He didn't put the product in a threatening space. He didn't build the social media backing. That's your moat. Because had he spent three years selling it himself he could and, and building a social media following, even, even if it's 5,000 followers, which isn't a lot, on every platform, then you say to Walmart, hey, I'm not going to sue you because you stole my idea. I'm just going to tell the truth to my audience. I'm going to put you on blast. I'm going to call up some documentary filmmakers and tell them what you're doing before we go into the legal battle. Because everybody loses in the legal battle. Mm-hmm. The only people that win are the lawyers. We had a lawyer on this podcast who admitted that. <laughs> so, damn, man, just focus on building your brand and protection will be inherent in that process. Well, and that's why... the Going back to the previous question of the guy saying about the invention for something like an automobile that, you know, it's a small part, trying to license into that mess and, and not having them be able to just incorporate that into the next thing without you even existing, it makes it near impossible. Absolutely. So unless you have something, unless you have proof of something, unless you have, it's it's nearly impossible to do. Absolutely, yeah. man. All right, so the last question, thank you for that, uh, Randy. Yeah. The last question... In a we look up, in a we look up. All right, the last question comes to us on Reddit from in a we look up. He wants to know about money management. Mm. It's more business related, he says, and paperwork management. Uh, so what if you make it and have a patent? Stores don't want to sell it without reps. Ideas? Question mark. How to advertise? Being everything other than the inventor, is hard work, and my brain is not geared or designed to function that way. So what do I do now? Get people who know. <laughs> that's what, that's, I'm in the same position, right? I'm, I'm at the capacity of what my brain can handle as far as running a company, being the social media guy, trying to figure out sales, figuring out websites, you know, managing the money, and uh, guess what? I'm okay at it. I am not amazing at it. But what I am starting to do is I am starting to find those people who are much better at it than I am. And that doesn't necessarily mean having to go spend tons and tons of money. You got to pick and choose where you're spending your money. But there are a lot of different resources to, to start doing that. There are a lot of online you know, ways to um, start keeping your receipts in order. There are fractional, what is it, the fractional? Um, Engineer, fractional CFO. Yeah. So basically that just means they're not full time. You're using them on on a kind of per basis when you need them thing and they can keep you in line like the the engineer, yeah. you know? Yeah, you reach your capacity, you reach out, they solve that one problem and that gets you past that, takes it off your plate and allows you to move on to the next. Yeah, you identify what things are eating your time. For mm-hmm. me, I identified engineering. It was killing me. And I'm not an engineer. I wasn't doing bona fide engineering, but I was drawing up crummy stuff on keynotes, PowerPoints, whatever you use. And so much measuring how big should the box be? What should the tolerances be? And sending my crummy drawings to China. Uh, so I sourced Lance at Freelance Designs in Canada. And yeah, man, now, now he works with me on all these projects. Uh, I pay him a fair rate per month just to have him around. He probably doesn't put in more than 8 to 12 hours of work for us per month. Mm -hmm. And it works out great. So 
back to what Marcus is saying, do what you do best and, and, and source the rest. Mm-hmm. So you're starting your company. The first thing you mentioned uh, was paperwork. You don't want to deal with paperwork. Well, well, the biggest paperwork in the beginning is your books. Mm-hmm. So you find a local accountant and business solutions expert, and for 110 bucks a month, they'll, they'll do your books. Uh, the next paperwork is is uh, sell sheets and stuff like that. Frankly, if I think if you can't make your own sell sheet, you're probably not, you know, you're not cut out for this. But I've been wrong many, many times. Maybe you can source somebody to find the sell sheet, and that's just fine. You're gonna watch your pennies, though. You know, you'd be amazed at how fast two and three hundred dollar projects add up. Uh, and you're gonna learn more about your product if you force yourself to build the sell sheet. Beyond that, the paperwork is really just a, a follow-up game. Uh, if you're trying to get into retail, that's where you hire a sales guy. Now you're saying to yourself, how do I hire a sales guy if I have no money? You're kind of dealing with that now. I mean, you 100%. have plenty of cash saved up for the business, but you're a businessman. You know that to pay a person, I have to justify that with income. Sure. How are you going about that right now at your stage, Marcus? Well, you know, and, and Grant's right. So I did save up. Uh, I have X amount of money, but I'm I'm not making enough money to support a salesperson right now. But it's the chicken and the egg thing, right? Because uh, you know I'm not selling because I don't have a sales guy, but I don't have the money. You know, it's where does that come in? Uh, in my case, there are a ton of different ways you can go about that too. Because some salesmen might work purely on commission, and they might be willing to. I think a lot of people in the beginning, when you're not making money, it's hard to convince them to do that. But there could be a good hybrid of that as well, where you pay a base and then they start making commission or they make a higher commission in the beginning based on sales so they can make that up. But yeah, in my case, luckily, hopefully, I think I've found somebody who can help out. Uh, cool. I'll keep you updated. Uh, meeting this person on Monday um, to to talk things over. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you know, I put out a, a resume search on Indeed and LinkedIn what I have learned is a lot of people have a lot of crappy resumes <laughs> and they float them full of garbage. And, and you know, say, you, you want to be pretty specific also with what kind of sales you want. Because there are people who are like, I make cold calls all day for solar energy companies. Like, that's great for somebody who's cold calling, but there's a whole difference between somebody who's like, I've got wholesale experience and I know how to talk to manufacturers and all this as well. So, I mean, the answer to that is, you know, you're going to have to eat. There's going to be some point where you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone as far as getting somebody quality. And I I have learned that when I thought I was going to be like, hey, I'll pay this amount per week, X amount, you get a totally different set of resumes than you do if you actually give a proper amount to do it. Mm -hmm. So... I think fundamentally for this gentleman's question, which is, again, how, how do I handle this stuff if I'm more of the inventor mindset mm-hmm. and less of the business mindset? You can achieve a ton just with inspiration. If you have the ability to inspire people, you can leverage that. You can leverage that more than money. What people want more than anything, they want autonomy, they want to be heard, and they want to feel like they're helping. Salary is really just secondary. Of course, salary is the first number you, you hear, but when you give people the, the, the feeling that they're on the ground floor of what's going to be something great, it carries a ton of weight. Sure. Candidly, I found my first and best employee on my neighborhood app. Mm. I put out a feeler, said, I need help at the warehouse. My back is killing me. I was testing straps because I got a bad shipment. And Steven said, hey, man, I'm recently laid off uh, from my sales job, not doing much. Seems like you're a neighbor. If nothing else, we can we can have a chat. He comes over and he tells me his background. And I said, no, 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 no. You're not moving boxes. You're going to be my new head of sales. <laughs> now, all I could ap- afford to pay him the first week was $15 an hour. That's 30 grand a year. That doesn't cut it here in California. In fact, that doesn't cut it anywhere in the U.S. Uh, but he said, he said, you know, I'm not doing anything else. Yes. And let's see where it goes from there. And I, okay, so I learned what he could do. For two weeks, I paid him cash, 15 bucks an hour. It was really cool. And then I said, yeah, man, you, you can do this. Uh, you know sales. If, if you can make, justify your wage, I can pay you 62 grand a year. And he said, yep, let's try it. And what we found was sales is really up retail. I've talked about it a lot. It's an uphill battle. It's a brick wall. 
but Stephen latched on to 15 other things that are so much more valuable to me than getting into retail. Mm. Things like dealing with customer service, things like um, communicating with the warehouse, checking on inventories, uh, all the little fires I used to have to put out. I trained him how to do all these things once, maybe twice. He got it. He figured it out. And now he can handle the things that, that so that I can focus on marketing and engineering. That's the only two things I'm good at. I'm not good at math. I'm not good at paperwork. I'm not good at accounting. I'm not good at sales. Uh, I don't have the drive to do follow-up. What I'm good at is shooting a stupid social media video and thinking of new inventions. And I think those are the two you know, this is obviously biased, but I think those are the two most important assets. If you can just be a creative guy or an engineering guy, find somebody who's the counterbalance. Find somebody who's the sales guy or, or woman, sorry. Uh, find somebody who's the numbers guy, right? But you got to have somebody on the team who's willing to get in front of a camera. Yeah. I'm pretty firm on <laughs> that because how else are you going to expose this? How else are you going to get the followers? A lot of people will partner up. So I'm good at engineering and, and you're good at engineering too. Let's let's start a company. Now you have a really well-engineered product that no one's ever heard of. Yeah. So find balance. D diversity, absolutely. And the, the only point to that is, you know, you, you are making a decent amount of money and now everything is great for for the, sorry, what was the person who asked the question? The uh, name? No name. It's weird. Oh, okay. call, call him Mr. Up. Mr. Up. Okay, Mr. Up. Um, yeah, man, I'm in, I'm in that boat. And the the difference I may have over you is I saved up knowing that I was going to have to eat it and spend this money at some point opposed to not having that money. But it's the same same idea. I'm going to be blowing through this cash quick. And if this person uh, isn't somebody who can help and start bringing in sales, then yeah, that's a that's going to be a big deal for me. And I'll keep you updated on that. But it's what do they say? They say hire slow, fire quick. Yes. So I've been through 50, 60 resumes. I, I have really taken the time. I've talked to a lot of these people on FaceTime. I've, I've, you know, gathered their personality and what they have to offer. Only two of those 50 people or three of those 50 people actually reached out personally and said, hey, I've checked out your product. I like what it is. Here's what I can do, which blows my mind. So there's no real cover letter game anymore. No. Uh, that could be a time of, you know, I'm 47, so that maybe that's my my time. But um, yeah. There's going to be the chicken and the egg thing. Don't be afraid at some point to spend that money. But in the meantime, the things like the books and all that stuff, there's a ton of little resources. You can hire people on a on a like a month basis or whatever it is to just keep things clean and keep things in order. So the fractional people, and that's just a great way to go. Absolutely. So I just want to repose the question one mm -hmm. last time before we wrap, the, mm -hmm. wrap this up. Is it better to license or build your product yourself? I just want to reiterate. Licensing is great for fuel, mm. but inventing and developing, that's money that could very well change your life. All right, guys, thanks a lot for tuning in. This has been episode 29 of the Invent With Me podcast. If you're listening, uh, follow the show on whatever platform you may be on. If you're on YouTube, certainly like and subscribe. Thank you guys very much for stopping by. Remember, Marcus and I took the punches so that you don't have to. At the end of the day, take advantage of that, and we'll see you on the next one. 